Okay, so what we are doing today is two things. The first one, as I said also yesterday and on the Telegram group this morning, is to start speaking about need finding uh, in preparation for assignment one that will be put online either later today or tomorrow. We need to just reread it once more and then can go online. It will be three pages of assignment, so please read it and work on test text comprehension uh, while you read it. Um, because it's, since it's two weeks, it has quite a lot of details on what things you are expected to do. Uh, we will cover, of course, the decision be behind those things in the lectures, but since we will complete this lecture on Monday and the text will be online f before Monday, you can have some, some gaps if you start reading, but you can start reading, especially if you already have a group, so that you can more or less know what you're expected to do in practice. And this is the first hour. The second hour today, it will be less theoretical. We will talk a little bit more about projects and um, so the general settings of projects and the three teams that we have this, this year with some, um, let's say, more information about the playfulness part of the second team and the AI part of the third team specifically. But that's the next hour. Um, so I told you that sometimes we will have the all of fame or of shame, and uh, today is sometimes. Uh, there is a seat here if you want. Hello. Well, not here, but you can move this. You can, well, also the microphone was broken, so it's in style with the room. Um, just try not to fall. Okay. Um, there is a seat here also, another here, but yeah, but there are out of like five people there. So, so here there is another seat, first row, second row, another seat, three. It's a smaller room, I told you. Um, so I was saying, uh, same game of yesterday, this time more in line with the, the topic of today that is need finding. So this video is about uh, Google Assistant. No, what's called the Google Home, uh, which is powered by Google Assistant. So. Think at the device per se. Think to Google Home, the mini, Google Home mini per se. How many of you have experience with this virtual assistant? Five people? Okay. Um, so, well, especially those who have some experience with this thing, would you put them in the Hall of Fame or the Hall of Shame in general? All of shame, okay. Not the answer I expected. Um, why in the all of shame? Because it's retarded. Because it's? Retarded, it's like latency, doesn't understand well. <clears throat> yes, there is not understand well. Uh, you cannot say whatever you want, of course. Um, okay, um, but you, you know how to use it, right? You are able to use it. Once you know what you can ask, you're able to use it, like the, fi the five of you that add it, right? No major problem in triggering uh, the, um, the assistant and get an answer, whatever right or, right or wrong, but still you get an answer. Okay, so let's have a look at this video, uh, which is uh, an Italian grandmother, uh, it's in English, so we should be fine. Uh, trying to use Google Home. Hmm? Cuckoo! <laughs> <laughs> what is the meaning today? What? 
Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> it said yeah. yeah. You say yeah. Yeah, it's her. Oh my God. Is it one more? Yeah. One? yeah. I'm, I'm glad, glad to meet you. What is this thing? I love you. Hey, you're okay. This sounds like from the You have to say. What's the weather, What the weather? Is? What the weather? Is? He wants to know what is the weather. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. In Flagler Beach tomorrow, there will be showers with a high of 65 and a low of 56. Who is this? What's up there? I'm scared. I'm scared. It's a mystery. Oh my gosh. No. Ask oh, Google to play the Italian song. Okay, not the Google. Um, so we, we are talking about, so is this your typical experience with Google Home? No. no. So we are talking about need finding. So if we need to find something uh, in this video, uh, so you, you already put, Google Home in the whole shame, so we cannot move it further in that. Uh, but if you have to learn something from this video about the device, so imagine you have to work on the device and you are observing this video, what are you learning? How can you improve the device? The activation word should be wider. Not the The activation word should be wider or easier. Easier is probably better. Okay, that's something you you learn from this. What else? She was trying to activate it by tapping. She was trying to activate it by tapping. So probably something more on the tangible side. Why was tapping? Because probably the other devices you operate, you operate with your hand, so you turn on something. And then there is one more thing on tapping. Then when you tap Google Home, it slides up. So it's a react to your tapping, but it's not listening to your command. So it's doing something, giving you the impression that is listening, but it's not, it's just reacting to your tap. Because it's not how the designer, how the developer thought about it. They thought about it by voice activation. And if you tap, there is another function that is not the primary function. But this person was tapping on it. The device was reacting to the tap. And that's so, the device is responding to me and I'm continuing to talk. Another things to learn. So lights, reaction could be calibrated. Something else.
Yes, uh, making a, a wider uh, activation world could be a problem because they could be activated other in other time. But even with the current activation worlds, this happens, as you're saying. So probably it's not a mat. So the problem with this person was not a wider activation world. It was like the difficulty in saying Google. She said Google. And so that's not understandable for that. So probably it's more on the easier part than not on the um, wider part. Anything else you can learn from this? Other languages, if it was in Italian, she would cooperate better. Who knows? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. We don't know, right? We, we don't see that from the video, a different language. But maybe it was in Italian, it was easier. But the person was speaking English, some some degree was saying I'm scared, right? At the, at the beginning, when uh, Google Home st started to provide the weather, so I think you can think about other two things here at least. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this, this is sort of related to the things we were saying before about the light. So different, better, in some way, mechanism to provide an, I'm listening, I'm not listening, either vocally or not. I think so you can learn two things, especially for maybe the elderly or people that are not used to technology. Two things came to my mind in the behavior of the person in this case. At the beginning, it was, she was surprised, and then she acted surprisingly. So if it was a self-instruction for the tutor, so they can explain, or it would be more user-friendly? Yeah, that part about being scared, being surprised, when the first time replied, and then she moved to probably her husband, and said, it worked, and I'm surprised, and said, I'm scared. Uh, and then try to, so there, there could be something about onboarding the person that should be done maybe differently when there is no uh, high level technology. Another thing, more particular maybe. Maybe adding visual impression like face recognition. For? For, for, for which purpose? This is, this still is in the activation modality feedbacks, right? And this is really computer science engineering thinking. Let's try to think back to the person, what's happened in the video, right? There is no uh, face recognition in the video, right? Just something that happened in the video. At a certain point, what this lady did, That's onboarding, yes, that's onboarding. And one difficulty with voice assistant, Google. Google. but... So you say, Google. Okay. Play the Italian song. So I have to lie up after you say that, otherwise we didn't hear you. Let me find it. You know how you know, I take me a of Play the Italian song. Okay. Or oh, hey, What she's doing? What she's doing? She's singing, yes. Why? What's the purpose of singing for this person? She expects you are listening, so if I'm singing, you She is, exactly. She's trying to say which song she wants to hear, and she's teaching Google Home to uh, that, that the song, and she's singing the song so that they can sing together in a way, or that 
at a certain point Google Home can recognize the song and start playing on it on. So this is something that is not uh, existing, right? In Google Home, this learning, teaching, recognizing songs while a song then you continue after me, like karaoke or something like that. And, but this is something that this lady was more prone to do than other things. Like, I want a song, maybe I don't remember the title, but I'm going to um, sing it to you so that you can learn and then you can sing it back next time maybe or if you have it you can sing hmm? this is a particular behavior hmm? so just watching this video if you are asked to provide suggestion on how to improve google home you can come out with the three four things we said easier um, word for activation better feedback for um, recognizing when it's listening, when it's not listening, uh, slash ta more tangibility in, in the thing, and maybe four, uh, better onboarding, and five, there's maybe possibility to like learn each other um, characteristic and functions in a way so that the person can like sing, and the Google system can learn and vice versa. The person can learn how to use it together. So in a more communication probably way. And would you imagine any of this before having seen this video? Or some of these? But you have the experience because you have seen, like, not the video, but the real, ver yes. the real version of the video, let's say, right? So, and did you have to ask anything to this person or to his grandmother to understand this thing? The other day we said, I want to, some, some of you said, I want to know what, what people want. Did you ask, do we know what she wants? Not really, right? We know what she did and we can try to interfere which are the problem. We have seen the problems and we can try to imagine which are the solutions to this problem. Okay? So this simple example is basically the key of what we are going to, well, not volume, <coughs> enough. Um, to what we uh, call need finding. So it's a process, it's a series of methods to find needs. And finding needs allow us to then define solutions, like a different word. That's a different word for activating, is a different, is a solution to a problem. And the problem is, which was the problem of a different word? Which was the problem? why we need a easier way to wake it up because she was wasn't able to uh, to wake up to say google to wake up the device the first, normally with the, the this default operations so a different word an easier word a different modality are solutions multiple solutions to solve that problem mm -hmm. so in this uh today and um, monday we will try we will go over different ways and also in assignment one you will go over using some of these methods to identify these problems to identify these needs so that later on in the course you can imagine solutions like an easier word like a tangible uh, interface for waking up mm? but in this moment we are talking about needs mm? that stem from problem pain points etc mm? so today we start talking about it and just to remind you this is a picture i've shown yesterday the general simplified human centered design process that we um, follow in this course that could be as i said yesterday um, that's common areas with many other human centered methodology like the agile interaction design or the design thinking etc so we are step one in this graph 
Mm? So understand what is needed mm? with some methodology and we call it need finding. And then since we need to understand and then we need to produce solutions, we will go to analyzing the results and then create a solution with the design and prototyping phase. Mm? So this will be the path we are going to do along the entire semester, basically. And then, we, as I said yesterday, we will loop in here a couple of times. Hmm? Um, here, a couple of times in this design prototype, design prototype, a couple of times. But today we are here, step one, understanding people, understanding what are the needs in a specific context. So let's start from a definition on what are needs. Also to recognize the difference between needs and wants, right? Uh, because the other day, some of you said, understand what people want, and they said, no, we want to understand what people need, not what the people want. So, what are needs? Hmm? And then I can use an example to, uh, to also explain this. So, needs are, by definitions, the one in quote, human, emotional, or physical necessity what I before called problem. What was the necessity of the lady with Google Home was triggering the voice assistant in a different, easier way for her. That was the necessity. And was, let's say, physical because it cannot, she cannot uh, execute, run, the, um, wake up the, the assistant. And, but we also have seen an emotional response at a certain point. So that's in the equation as well. Uh, another way to define needs, especially when you have something existent like uh, Google Home, is to call them as gaps in the system. Hmm? You have processes, you have a system, you have something, and this something is not working smoothly. And you have learned tricks to do things. Like if I click here and then I click there and they go back, then it works. If instead I don't do these three things, it gives me an error for whatever weird bug there is there. Mm -hmm. So this clicking multiple times, it, it showed a gap in the system. Mm -hmm. Or also if you maybe download things from different parts and they put together because there is not a unique view on this information, that's a gap, a necessity for the system maybe to have a more uniform representation of, of um, of information. So, necessity, gaps in a system, and they are verbs. A need is never a noun. So, a different, as I said before, a different wake up word is not a need because a different wake up word is not a verb. There is no verb in this. Uh, But something to trigger, to activate the device is probably a need. And then the difficulty is what is the something? And that's the solution. That the thing that you as designer, creator, developer, etc., need to figure out. Um, but people are terrible in, well, they think to know what they want, but they don't really know what they want because it's not their job to design system, to create system. Their job is to use them. So they will express what they can do or cannot do with their own knowledge and their own terminology that is not the knowledge that you have as developer, etc. It's their knowledge as users. And they can only speak about things they know. They cannot speak about possibility they don't know. And for those, you are there to figure out which are the other possibilities. Mm -hmm. So needs are verb. So every time you will figure out a, uh, a need that is not a verb, then it's probably not a need. Mm -hmm. It's more a want or it's more a solution. Uh, so verbs, activities and desire with which user could use help. Mm -hmm. Nouns are instead solutions. Uh, often needs are described or are useful to be described, especially you, when you will need to, at a certain point, you will need to describe needs. The needs you identified through the need-finding process, 
you will need to say, I found these needs. Mm? So a helpful way to uh, describe these needs is say, people, whatever they are, needs a way to. And that's what's come after the to is probably the need. Or needs to be able to. Mm? So these are a good way to help you uh, formulate a need in a way that is correct. And they emerge directly from user traits or form contradiction between two traits, such as a disconnect between what they say and what they do. Maybe they say, I do this in this way, and then if you can observe, like we observe this lady, in a way you discover that what they say is not identical to what they did in every single step. Because one, one thing is what we remember, or what we want to communicate, and one thing is what we do, especially if there is something that is not working, or some troubles, like in this way, maybe you are not happy to say another person, I'm not able to wake up Google Home. Maybe you don't want to say that. So you say something more nicer, either to the other person, or either for yourself, but if you analyze then the evidence, the observation, you discover that actually there are other problems there. Hmm? So, as I was saying the other day, humans are, I said, as a mess, but hmm, we, we have reactions, we have uh, pride. Uh, if you are talking with a Google uh, engineer that is interviewing you for knowing uh, um, something about Google Home, oh, maybe you don't want to say them, maybe you won't say them, this is terrible, it's not working. Maybe you are kinder than that because you want to keep a good relationship. So there are other human factors in the middle, in the communication. So not always what they say coincide with what they do. So this is a classical example of what is like a need or better, a solution that comes from a need. There is a path and there are people crossing the, the green. Uh, so, the system is the path, well done, well designed, and then there is too long and a cross in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, so, need finding in discover opportunities for recognizing that there is a gap. Mm -hmm. So, for recognizing that this path is not used and people are crossing, so probably there, there is the need to find a way to move from this position to that position. And how this is possible, well, one can build a path in the middle of the green or can do other things. Depends on the, on, on the, on the environment uh, outside of these pictures. Hmm? But that path in the green is a solution, again. Um, so that is like a possible solution. Hmm? So need finding is about figure out the story of what is happening and why is happening. And then build a new story that starts from your solution. Uh, so before moving to need finding, let's stay a little bit on needs because it's something that typically you struggle, not you. Your colleagues in the past years struggle a little bit. And the first version of needs in the vast majority of projects were actually solutions because you like solutions. Let's say that. Uh, let's say it's easier to think about um, the, um, the face recognition than not thinking about other things. But face recognition is a solution to a problem. It's not the description of a problem. It's not the need that stems from the problem. That solution is fine, but it's one of the many solutions. And we want to understand which are the underlying problems, the underlying necessity to design multiple solutions on top of them. So let me tell you this short story. Um, so let's move back many years and uh, let's go in the United States when Henry Ford, the car maker, just created the first car, like the Model T. So how many cars there were in that moment around the city? before the creation of the first Ford car? Not many. Not many. Let's reduce this not many to, to around zero, right? Uh, maybe there were other cars prototype in other parts of the world, but in the city where Ford created the car, there was just that one. Um, so how people moved? 
How people moved without cars? On foot, on foot or? Carriage. Or? Carriage. carriage, that is what's moved the carriage. A horse. A horse. Or, if it's more probably longer distance, right. train. Okay, so these are the options that people had. So, uh, Henry Ford created the first car, and this is the story, it's probably not true, but this is a story that we can use here. Uh, a journalist asked him, did you ask people what they want? And Henry Ford say no, because if I had asked them what they want, they would have answered a faster horse. Um, and he went on and created a car. So let's imagine that he asked people, he asked like 10 people, and all of 10 people um, said, I want a faster horse. So you are doing need finding for the project and on building something physical for transportation and all people tell you, I want a faster horse. Are you going to be your engineer engineered a faster horse? Or maybe not. It's an option to be engineer on horse, right? It's not that. What are you going to do? A car is a faster. That's another point that we will come after. So a faster horse is a need that people had or not? Yes. No. A faster horse is not a verb. So it's not a need. What is a faster horse? Solution. A solution. Which is the need that stems from the faster horse? And for which a car is also a solution because it's in a way a faster horse. Which is the need that stems from I want a faster horse? Which was the problem? Transfer easily. Transfer easily. Why is faster? It's not necessarily easier. Uh, sorry, easier. Faster. What we can describe the need as a way to move faster than an horse than nowadays from point A to point B. Okay? So this is the need. Which are the solutions to solve this need? The car is a solution. A faster horse is a solution. You can try to be engineer, engineered an horse to make it faster. I don't know if it's possible or not, but you can try. And that's a valid solution. Or you can uh, create a smaller train to move in the city like a tram. Or there are many solutions from that need. But that need didn't stem from the answer of people. The people told a solution, a want. And why people talked about horses? Because they only know horses. Because the usual transportation mean it was horses. So their reference was an horse. So if I need to describe you, my problem is that I want a faster horse. And then this is something less extreme that will happen when you will do need finding. You will go to people and people will describe their issues, their desire, their wants in their own term. They will tell you, I want an application for doing that. I want this feature. And it's your job starting from this feature, this application, because they know that, their experience is on that. They do something using an application, a tool, whatever, to do one step more and say, how can I move from this specific solution they had in mind to the need that is behind that solution? And maybe that need is, that, that thing that they said is a perfectly valid solution for the need, or maybe it's a terrible idea and you have a better one. And most of the time you have a better one. In a way similar to Henry Ford that didn't try to be engineered on horse, but created something totally different that is a car. And like horses and cars, now let's move today, we know that cars are not a perfect solution, that they had their own set of trouble, like pollutions, etc. Hmm? But for solving that need was a valid alternative, and back then pollution 
actually the car polluted less than a horse back then. Why? Well, the numbers help, but also in that moment, the small cars pollute less than a uh, small number of cars pollute men less than the horses, which kind of pollution the horses do. Yes, I, let's say a gene on the streets. They do their things on the street and that's pollution if you leave them. And if you have 100 horses moving around the city and uh, having their needs every hour, then you have quite a lot of methane to, uh, in the atmosphere and also things to collect around the city. The car didn't have this problem. You don't have to collect anything from a car. Um, it just need its own kind of food. Okay, so this is uh, an example about a, in a story in a way um, that describe what you will in a way simpler listen to the people you will interact with. They will tell you things about horses, about their own horses. And it's up to you to do a step more considering what, you, what they said but also what you have seen, like in the video, you have seen things and merging together what you have seen and what they say, you can generate stronger needs, okay? And there are methodology and the scope of this lecture is also to go through this methodology to talk effectively or observe effectively people doing stuff so that you can get their wants first and transform them in needs. And we will arrive to those. So, what's need finding? Need finding is a way to finding potential user needs. Uh, so, answering to the question, what do user need? Mm? That's the question we, we pose up to this moment. Uh, but to answer that question, we need to answer first, and this is something we can do on our own, without involving up, our, other people, these other four questions. That is, who are they? So, who we are going to explore their needs? There will be students, there will be like the el elderly people, like the lady, there will be children, there will be people who don't see at all, like blind, or who will be? Hmm? And there are many dimensions on that. Age is one dimension, capability with technology is one dimension. Um, experience on the stuff you are interested in is one dimension. Are they expert in their domain or they are just try to do this for the first time? So who are the users? And how they are doing in it now? So you have a specific domain, let's say you want to um, try to understand which are the issues in um, commuting between work and home and back within a city. So you are going to maybe speak with commuters and maybe you're going to speak with people that commute every day and maybe with people that do also a little bit of remote working. So you have the expert, the one that do it every single day, twice a day or four times a day if they go home for lunch and the non-expert, the ones that are casual in a way users on your domain. And how they are doing now? which are their practices in the commuting, at which time they are waking up. They have an annual um, subscription, they buy the ticket, they don't use tickets, whatever. And what they do during the, the travel, how long is the travel? They take a bus, they take a, tra a tram, they take multiple bus, buses or not. What they are doing now? Hmm? Um, what's the context in which they are doing? going to work and back home. That's something you define, but this is something you define. And, and why we can just ask them all the things we want to know. Mm? This is not actually uh, an answer to give, but why we can just go to them and say, tell me your problem in commuting. Three seconds, one question. Why this is not really working to you? It's like, tell me, um, 
I probably I should probably stop recording, uh, but try to be kind in answering. What's your problem with Politecnico? You are able to reply to that to this um, to this question, no? Yes. We can take from probably five minutes to get an answer or three days to get a complete set of answers who knows depends from your experience etc but is that something one single question posed in this way useful to understand the full picture the full context of where you are who you are and how you find yourself in this problem because i can imagine that maybe an erasmus there are erasmus students here no an erasmus student that's the school print of the limited number of, uh, in the, of the class. Um, Erasmus students will have different difficulties that are normally uh, enrolled students because they go to a different process. And they will see things differently because they have as a reference their own university. Ex uh, did, did any of you did the bachelor degree not here? Okay as maybe the people that did the bachelor degree here will see different things at the first year than people that didn't because their experience, their reference, their horses was the previous university. So we need to find a way to have a more systematic way to collect this information and analyze them considering this context of people. So we can just go there and ask them, tell me your problem. We need to find a better way to do this. So before talking about better way to do this, let's talk about users because selecting users uh, is the fundamental part of all of these. If you select the wrong kind of people to talk, then the results will not be good as you desire. So first of all, who are the users of the system? As I was saying before, it's a uniform set of people like all 20 years old, male, or it's more varied. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be different categories, different groups. Um, it's young, older, uh, novice in the activity, expert in the activity, something in the middle. So when you think about who they are, your user, don't think a generic person, but think about specific categories you want to understand their, let's say, necessity in a specific domain, like commuting every day or commuting between home and work. Uh, you are not a representative user, even if you are, let's say, commuting from home to here and vice versa, you are not a representative user uh, because you have skill, knowledge, attitude, background, interest, etc., etc., that are totally different from a generic commuter mm, that is not a student following this course, for instance. And this is especially true when technology is involved because you as computer engineer or data science engineer students have a different relationship in a way with technology than a history student remaining on the same age and on the same population of students. Uh, well, if you are also working or when you're going to work, the client is not a user. Um, one problem that many companies has is that the, the needs came from the client, but the client is not the one that needs to use the system. The client is someone that takes the system and then sell it to other people. Uh, and, but the client is typically someone that thinks to know how the other people work, and it happens that it's not really true. So, um, especially in company, client, but also manager, bosses, directors, etc., are people to kindly say, yes, and can we talk with like the people who are going to use the things we are going to do, not just with you. It's not always easy, but uh, it's one effort in a company. We are not in a company, so we, are, we can skip that for a moment. Uh, how we can then know the users. There are a variety of methodology, but they are in a way split into big categories. One is talking with people and one is observing people. Hmm? So talking with people uh, could mean survey, like online questionnaire, 
that's a survey. Interviews, like television interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews. Uh, there could be direct involvement. Uh, I mentioned yesterday participatory design. That's a way to involve users in the process, but you need to be a certain degree of experience in doing that. Uh, and the key point of talking to, with user is understanding the real behavior, the pain points in a process, in a context, in a situation. The workaround that people put in practice to solve some problem they have. That's an all good starting point to understand the context and find needs. The other big set is watching user. So observation, like we sort of did with this video. We observe a situation. Um, that could be done live, like your colleague did with his grandmother in a way, or through video recording like we did today. And then we need to analyze this data, of course. Um, diaries is another methodology that consists on actual diaries that the person needs to write every day or every time something happens, like a dear diary, this is blah, blah. Uh, this is a diary. So every time I need to interact with Google Home, I need to write something to answer to some question on a piece of paper or on a software application. Um, this is helpful for analyzing their work since what they say is not always coherent in what they do, observing what they do, give us much more data points than just asking them because we can see what they do, which, which software they use, which artifacts they use, which tool they use. If they use paper, pens, a computer, a tablet, what they do in practice for solving some task, uh, in which order they do things, where they are problem, if they get irritated, if they get interrupted by someone. And, and we can also discuss with them the finding to discover why they do a certain things in one way and not in another. Uh, to make it like more concrete, uh, one way of seeing that if you are, want to understand, let's say, which are the needs of people working like as uh, nurses, one way to do that, a long way to do that, is like observing them in their job and then you got to see all their processes you got to see what they do in the morning, what we do at the beginning of a turn, at the end, in the middle, how many times they get interrupted, how many patients they need to uh, take care of, how many administrative requests they receive, all these small details, how many coffee breaks they can have, how many bathroom breaks they have, etc. All this information is something you will not be able to collect by an interview in which they need to recall what's happened typically in the morning or typically, and then it's typically, so it's average. Instead, you go in the situation. Uh, so both groups of methods have their own advantages and disadvantages. Of course, interviews is easier. Imagine you have to get permission to see 10 nurses in their own days. You will need to spend at least 10 days in some hospitals. Talking with 10 people, it's way quicker and easier in a way. But you can miss some why and some artifacts. So these are methodology. We are going to see on Monday some of them and we will ask you to uh, adopt, let's say, one and the half of them. Hmm? So not all of this, of course. Uh, oh, in some cases, and this is more on a theoretical perspective, uh, users are not available or for whatever reason. You cannot access to the, those users. Um, for policy, for regulation, because you want to do something for astronauts and you don't have enough astronauts to talk with. Um, so you can also try to imagine users uh, or building typical users from the information, maybe partial that you have, putting together information that you have, that you find on the internet, that you find talking with some people that are not maybe exactly your user, but sort of similar to them. Uh, so maybe you cannot access to an astronaut, but you can talk with a pilot of an air, or on a jet. So that's pretty similar, more than talking with a student, for instance. 
So you can build these personas that has imaginary typical users that provide a detailed description of a person in a given role doing some kind of activity and then imaging them as they were real. So this is a way to describe, this is also a way to describe what the results of, a, of an finding phase, but it's also a way to imagine um, some prototypical user when you don't have access or enough access to real, let's say, people. Uh, one thing before moving to the um, uh, to need finding is about problem framing. Because up to now, we talk about needs, we talk about people, uh, but we didn't talk about framing the problem. I mean, the problem, I framed the problem for you. I said the domain we want to, for instance, operate is transportation, like a team for the lab, transportation. Instead of health and well-being, transportation. And the problem we want to understand and want to try to frame is com commuting between home and work. Um, but you will have to do this operation on the team of the, of the lab. So one, um, before extracting needs, one skill that you need to have is, and before solving problem, that is something you were trained for the last four years, almost five at least, is not solving problems, but framing problems. That is the step before. And so understanding which is the problem, so that we can understand which is the needs, so that we can solve the problem, hmm, in a way. And it's solving the problem should be the easiest part. It's, it's typically, for you, for the students in this course, the easy part. Solve problem. is define the problems more, more difficult. Hmm. So when we um, enter in a situation, hmm, let's say that we define the commuting, uh, we need to check and please keep this in mind because it's fundamental, especially when you will prepare the material for need finding. We need to check our assumptions on the things we are going to listen, watch, talk about, and also understand which are the other people's assumptions about us, about what we're going to do, and about their own activity. Because in all in that way, we can understand the need, the context, and emphasize with them. So let me do this example. Uh, this, it's about assumptions, right? So let's say that a person came to you and pick a piece of paper and draw this um, thing that I, there is in the slide. You see, this is not, this is handmade, of course. And ask you, what's the result? Eight. Eight. Anyone disagree? So this is a, obviously a tricky question, because otherwise I will not ask. What's the result? Eight. Who say eight? Ends up, who say eight? Okay. The one that didn't say eight, what they say? Two figures of four. So the result is two figures of four. You see, the result is two, two four, two of this figure of four, one after the other, like concatenation, in a way. Anybody else? So we had a majority of eight, someone saying to figure four. The others, because there are others. Could be ten. If it's, uh, eight. Could be ten. Uh, others? So one more, and then I will tell you why this answer could be all wrong. Maybe it's 
maybe it's a rebus and but the, the figures with are you don't know so this is about assumptions did i tell you that these are numbers nope you assumed that these are numbers in some basis but it's number four figures of four and that the plus is either a sum or a concatenation but i never said that it's not written here that's your assumption so if you end up seeing something like this in a need finding you will assume this is mathematical operation and that the result is eight but i never said that this could be four or could be a uh, part of a boat the top part of a boat and the plus could be not a plus could be another symbol uh, and the result is not eight but is two boats for instance a double boat similar to the figures like concatenation uh, and maybe these are not equals these are minus so it's a boat plus another boat minus something that is missing in the picture So this is a very simple example that tests in a simple way one assumption that probably all of you had at the first side. At the first side you said 8 because this, this looks like 4 and there is a plus operator that typically is number and there is an equal, something that looks like an equal and then it's an operation mathematical. So be careful because even this small case this is an assumption that you don't know if it's true so what you could have done instead of assuming that these were number if i show you this what's the right things for you to do is asking me are these numbers is this an operation what what this mean no what this mean is a four or not is this a plus like some or not so it won't happen in your need finding but you will and that's why you need to check your assumption you will go in situation assuming things like you came in this situation assuming numbers so the more closer you are with the topic you are going to select the more assumption you will bring in the equation and the more assumption you will bring in your equation the less uh, important and fundamental the needs will be because those will not be needs from the people but will be stemming from your assumption for your thinking mm -hmm. so if you're going to do something with the university students you will have a huge assumption there that you will need to check and be sure that you are not bringing that in if you are creating questions in the questions like assuming that the question is understood in a specific way if you are deciding to observe something for instance to make an example as before you are not bringing uh, any process that you follow but any oh but i know this is a problem because i experienced that problem that's an assumption that you are making so if you're going to do something with students, you will have a huge checking of your assumption. On the other side, if you're going to do something with, I don't know, children in primary schools, then your assumption will be fewer. You will have some assumption. You can imagine what's going on. So you will bring some assumption on the table, but obviously fewer than talking with polytechnic students because there is this strong vicinity so one thing to keep in mind before engaging with any methods we are going to see and any needs instruction etc is to be sure that your assumption are outside of the equation or as much as possible outside of the equation okay this again is a small example that makes the point and by the way, I steal it, it's not mine. I've seen it and I say, oh, this isn't smart, and I'll get it. And then it's not so smart, but still, makes the point. Okay, need-finding methods. 
Mm? So we talk about user, we talk about the importance of problem framing and assumptions. Mm? So it's important to frame the problem before solving it. Let's have a look at which are the methods we are going to cover. Um, and then we probably start to speak about the first one. Mm? So there are, again, many methods. Here there is six of them. We are going to see four of them. Uh, one is observation, similar to watching that video, but in real world. Uh, the other one is diaries, already mentioned to you. Uh, interviews, one-to-one -one speaking. Uh, and we are going not to talk about diaries. We are going to talk about interviews. We are not going to talk about focus group, but focus group as are basically group interviews. Instead of interviewing one person, you interview five of them in the same moment with their own specific specificity in how you handle the conversation, provided that it's always one person to talk and the other four don't. Uh, survey, like online questionnaire. So huge number of people reached with respect to interview in the same time. And then contextual inquiry. Um, that is, in the end, because it's actually um, a mix between observation and interview. So we will say a little bit about context inquiry because we will, we have see, we will see what is needed in when we talk about observation and when we talk about interviews, and that's the merge, in a way, of them. So, uh, to get started, before applying any of these methods, you will need to do three things. And here I reported four because the fourth is start with the method. So, after, after having identified and found the users to interview, to run a survey, to observe, to pick the method you want to pick, what you need to do in most cases is, especially if it's in person, uh, so not an online questionnaire in a way, introduce yourself and try to make the participant or the participants comfortable. This is fundamental in interviews and in-person interaction. In a survey online, you, you cannot really make the participants comfortable, but you can still introduce the goal of the thing, why you're doing that, how long is the survey, etc. So a little bit of introduction. Um, then you should, you should discuss confidentiality, or at least in the case of a survey, have consent. Whatever is going on there, is subject a consent form that they will need explicitly to give you permission to use this information. In a critical way, if you are filming or recording, you need to have explicit written permission to record and, um, and record either audio and or video and to use the information you are collecting in an anonymous way, just for course purposes in this case, but you need to have them on file, not just vocally. Yes, I agree. And in discussing confidentiality and getting explicit consent, if the person say no, at any point, even after this point, the person should be free to leave the uh, session and you need to drop all the data that you collected up to that moment. So these are fundamental things. Um, then you can begin to introduce the topic, the goal, you are, understand you are interested in understanding, and then at that point you can start the real hmm, uh, observation, interview, focus group, whatever it is among the need-finding methods. So, as we said before, well, we have a sentence here that we exper experienced before. You can observe a lot just by watching. We have watched a video and we learned a couple of things that we, if we don't have a Google Home and a grandmother at home, uh, we have learned quite a lot of things about one specific product and how to improve it. So what is observation? Observation is embedding yourself in other people environmental, culture, and behavior. So in the full context of them. 
and the goal is to obtain the data that is necessary to influence the design of an application, an interface, to extract need, to then move to solution, and that is design an interface, but it's also to redesign something. If you already have a product like Google Home, you can observe to see how they use it so that you can improve it. So to redesign, in a way, something that you have. Uh, it's also useful for learn the language of the user and their context. Again, the example I made the other day, if you're talking with doctors in hospital, they use a specific language. And any application for doctors will need to comply with that language. You cannot explain things in a different way than they are used to. And the same word that doctor use maybe is totally uh, inappropriate for you. You don't understand the same word, but they did. So it's their own language, their own jargon. And that could be fine in that context. So you need to understand the language and of the environment. Uh, well, listen and observe carefully. And sometimes you can ask questions and clarification. Uh, as I said before, you can audio, video record and take notes in any case. And the risk of observation is that you can misinterpret what you've seen. Uh, you are disrupting the same thing you are observing because that operation that nurses, we said before, that did the usual work that day is interrupted by your presence because normally you are not there. So it's something, it's an element of destruction, it's a new element in the practice. So you can risk disrupting the normal practice and get not real 100% pure information. And you can also overlook important information because maybe you see many things going on and then it's more difficult to understand which are the really important things and which are the lesser important things because everything seems equally or in a way important enough. Uh, what we learn by observing, we learn what people do now in their practice, in their processes. What values and goals they have. How these activities are embedded, are inserted in a larger day or in a larger set of people working. Uh, similarities and differences across people. You observe one nurse and then the day after you observe another nurse and you see same work, same setting, but slightly different operations. And you can also observe other type of context, like the time of the day. It's morning, maybe something happened in the morning that didn't happen in the evening or vice versa. In the night, for sure, the night in an hospital is really different from the morning in the same hospital. So the work in these two moments is extremely different. And if you just ask how the day is going, you get an average between all the moments and don't see the specificity of the specific moment. And you can also learn uh, unspoken knowledge, so things that they do by habits, but maybe it is not something normal for you or something not to observe with something important, but they do it normally, naturally, after 10 years doing that specific process, job, whatever. But this is maybe something important that they used to do, but is actually maybe a major problem. Uh, and they do it in that way because there is a huge problem behind. Um, and then you also could learn the process versus the practices. So one thing is the process is go there, do that, this and do that. Another thing is the actual pra practice of doing that process. So I can tell you the process of filling out the study load for a student. And you could tell me in, many, in how many ways your practice differed for the normal standard process because maybe you want to change something or you have something in overbook or whatever. An exam is not registering yet. So the practice is different from the textbook process. And maybe it's different from him, it's very different from than the same practice that he had for the same process. And um, as I said, well, process is how finger fish is supposed to happen and practice instead are the set of workaround pain point, tricks, 
messages on the Telegram group asking for things, information um, that happens from experience, from other people, emails to teachers to understand what's going on, etc. And all of these are part of the daily mundane activity for that process and activity, but it's not textbook written hmm, as a process. So all these things I think you can learn by observation and not all these things you can learn by just asking people in, say, in like an interview. <coughs> Uh, and then there are various types of observation, uh, which I would say we will see on Monday. So now we can take 20 minutes break and then reconvene here to talk not about unit finding, but about the project for the course, the teams, and moving to the exam. <laughs>